take up the offering. Right after that video. <laughs> hey, congratulations to all those who got baptized. Let's give them a nice, another, another round of applause. And um, then um, go right ahead, guys, if you're ready, ushers. Thanks for, uh, thanks for giving today. Okay, so Andy Gregory, my uh, good best interpreter in the city, man, he can... This is Andy. He does a great job uh, interpreting, correct? Okay, and his wife, Cassidy. Uh, but Blair and Sharon Baker right there, and, of course, Jody up here. Thank you guys for being a part. And uh, we had a great lunch. Blair and Sharon Baker and I had a great lunch this past, I think it was Wednesday. We had, a, we had eight. Yeah, it was Wednesday or Thursday, one of those times, yeah. You paid, so it was awesome, okay? He paid paid yeah <laughs> anyways here was on their heart they said how can we get more deaf people to come to church okay right did I do that right perfect all right thank you uh, thanks and I said I would say something this morning so so we can uh, if you know of anybody who is deaf anybody who's deaf you know, let him know at 11 o'clock, Andy's on the stage, and he's doing the interpretation. Okay? All right, perfect. Love you. God bless. All right? All right, good. All right, let's talk about money. Woo, I love money. Okay. <laughs> well, we've tried. We've talked about it uh, as much as we can. And uh, without being like, oh, you know, I knew the church would talk about uh, money a lot and you know, I'm visiting and da, da, da. And, and, uh, but it's been a different series. I encourage you to go online and check out the rest of the other two messages that have to do with money. And it's just, it's kind of, it's, it's totally different than uh, what you may think. And so Mike Brocker, I'm just going to move this back just a little bit because I don't want to get really uh, anxious or what do you call it? Uh, moving around and knock anything over. Okay, there we go. Okay, so uh, here's what Paul said in Acts 20 and verse 35. It's up on the screen. And I have been a constant example, Paul's talking, of how you can help those in need by working hard. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. So let's just say the words of the Lord Jesus together. You ready? It is more blessed to give than to receive. Let's do that again. It is more blessed to give than to receive. The central message of Christianity, the central message of Christianity is to give. Everything that God created or God designed was created to give. Everything in God's economy was created to, in this cycle of giving. The sun, even though it's 105 degrees out today, I love the sun. I'll take the sun over 30 degrees below zero any day of the week. I love the sun. The sun, they tell us that sun makes us feel better about ourselves. It puts us in a good mood. If you don't, if you don't overdo it, of course, you know, and it, it helps in your immune system. It, it, it builds your immune system up. The sun, just think God created the sun. You know, and it's burning 24-7, and it's keeping us warm around the world. God created it. He created everything that God designed was created to give. The stars give. The moons give. Uh, the planets give. Plant life gives. Animals give. You know, everything. You know, even uh, as we were created on the sixth day, human, humankind, mankind, you know, we were created to give. That's how God designed us. Now, you may not know this name, and you may have heard this name in the past few days, but his name is Antonio Brasco. Antonio Brasco's wife is named Marjorie, and she worked at the Walmart in El Paso, Texas. When the murderous uh, gun, the shooter, took her life, uh, they were married for 25 years, and the community in El Paso has... You know, they've come around each other and they've really, uh, you know, gotten strong. And that's, the, that's been the emphasis there. But 
Antonio felt like, you know, we didn't know many people. Uh, my wife Marjorie knew a few people at work, but I have no more family around. So he just placed, he just put it on uh, Facebook. If anybody would like to just come out and be a part of my wife's home going, uh, that would be amazing. Well, on, Antonio had no idea that hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people would come to the visitation on Thursday. And then on Friday when they laid Marjorie to rest, she was the last out of the 20 or so that were murdered two weeks ago on Saturday. She was the last funeral that they had. And on Friday when the funeral uh, took place, over 700 people showed up. Uh, for Marjorie's funeral. And, and he wept as he stood there at the coffin and shook hands with people as they come by and they hang. People that he didn't know and people didn't know him. But it was just how it was a wonderful giving spirit of people in that community that surrounded Antonio and the families of that community. That's how God's designed us. That's how God's created us. He's created us uh, to give. Now, the most uh, f familiar and um, favorite verse, if you will. There's a lot of verses that, you, but one of the, the well-known verses that we know is John 3.16, for God, you know, the greatest giver, the greatest giver of life, the greatest giver of eternal life, you know, for God so loved, so loved the world that he gave the greatest gift, his son, that who, whosoever would believe in him would not perish but would have everlasting life life. That is the power of the gospel because you see the gospel is always giving. The gospel was designed to give. The gospel when, when, when all four, you know, uh, went through the waters of baptism this morning, Stacy and Megan and, and, and Cole, and uh, there was one other one who, there was a fourth one, uh, but they gave their lives to Christ. And their lives, Nathan, and their lives to Christ uh, are given. They, now the gospel gives. The gospel has given them, the gospel has given them eternal life. And the gospel has given us gifts. And gospel has given us eternal life. And the gospel has given us means and ways to share that. And so we look for ways and you pray and you ask God to give you ways. And how can I be a help? How can I reach out to somebody? How can I, how can I look and see somebody who's in need? How can I do that, God? And so you pray specifically. It might be in an event downtown. It might be a concert that you've attended or a sporting event. And, and you walk out and you see that person, you know, they're holding that little cardboard sign that says, God bless you. You know, I'm in need. I'm hungry. Please help me. And you reach into your pocket. This is a means and it's a way. And you may give that person a, a, a few dollars that you have. Or you drive up to a, a stoplight or to a stop sign and uh, that person, there's a person standing there and they've got a little cardboard sign and, you know, you reach into your pocket and you roll your window down and you say, here, you know, here, here, here's, a, here's a couple dollars. Here, here's something, you know, I, I, I want to help you. I want to I, I help. And so you're, you're asking God to show you ways and means that you can help. Dan Miller, who attends here, he and his wife, Becky, they've been attending, attending here for now about seven or eight years. He owns two businesses, uh, Tan U Tanning, one in Reading and uh, one in Western Hills. And it's just good to see that uh, how Dan and Becky, and Dan got involved in our ministry team here, our security team, a couple of years ago almost two years ago, and it really kind of catapulted him into other areas of ministry. He was attending, and he was being faithful and uh, doing his part, but it really just made him uh, feel a part of something, you know, and uh, accountable as well as that. And uh, I was talking to him Monday night over at the, over at the Bread of Life, and uh, Joseph, uh, who's been attending here, who's one of the directors of City Gospel, was sharing with him how a church that he knows in the downtown area or, or close to the downtown area, every Tuesday night, they get their resources together and they go down and they, and they feed the homeless. And I think that's excellent. And Dan says, I want to do that. Uh, you know, he's working there at the Bread of Life. And then on Tuesday, he says, you know, I want to go downtown and, and help the homeless. So, you know, there's, there's things that, you know, God gives us, you know, these, these opportunities. Well, then let me say this. 
because I want to mention it from last week. I talked about the rich young ruler that came before Jesus and said to Jesus, said, hey, Jesus, um, what do I have to do to in, in, inherit eternal life? And Jesus said this, and Jesus knowing the motive of his heart, said, sell all you have, all your possessions, and give, and give them to the poor. And he went away very sad because he was expecting a whole different answer from Christ. And Christ was just looking at a, at a heart, heart motive. And he saw his heart motive. And he wasn't willing to do what Christ had asked him to do. So the question is, well, what about investments? You know, what about, what about 401ks? And what about those things? Are they wrong? Are we supposed to sell everything that we have and give it to somebody else and not have you know, to retirement and all these things. Listen, Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount was very plain when he said, don't lay up treasures here on earth, uh, but store up treasures in heaven. And that would make us think, well, uh, is once again, is Jesus saying it's, it's wrong to invest? And Jesus is not saying that at all. Uh, Jesus was very clear at the Sermon on the Mount. He said, hey, listen, you know, sermons or investments are going to go away. Uh, the stock market's going to crash. Uh, different things that we invest in, you know, we can't trust in them. This is what Jesus is saying. Don't put all your trust in those things that you think may take you to the end of life. He says, man, invest. Yeah, take care of yourself. I mean, take care of yourself when it comes to retirement. Put those, say, it's good to have it. He's not saying that any of those things are bad. He's just saying, trust in me. Trust in Christ. Trust in Jesus. That's where our hope lies. That's where God takes us, you know, to another level in our Christian walk with him. Now, there's a story about investments, and it's in Matthew 25 and verse 14. And I want to take time just to read these verses. Follow along. It's about investments. In verse chapter 25 of Matthew, beginning in verse 14. Again, the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is speaking here, and this is a parable. This is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He first gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. He then left on his trip. The servant who received five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. After a long time, the master returned from his trip. And he called them to give an account of how they used his money. The servant to whom he had, uh, had given five more or five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I've earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who received two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I've earned two more. Uh, the master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with one bag of silver came to the master and said, I know you are a harsh man harvesting crops, and you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look here, here's your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I had harvested crops, I didn't plant and gathered crops, I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant, give it to the one with 10 bags of silver. To those who use well, they are given. Even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this youthless servant into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's very strong words uh, from Jesus. Jesus is telling the story. Now there's two things that happen. 
when the master goes away and the master comes back, if there wasn't the investment that was made that he had asked about his money, here's two things. Here's two reasons why they wouldn't invest. One would be that they hated their master. The other one would be that uh, they were just lazy. And so the picture is this. Jesus is telling this earthly story. He's making this analogy. And he's comparing the master to, you know, to himself as the son of God who the Holy Spirit gives us who have received the gospel, many gifts and, uh, you know, talents and those things that uh, God has given us to use, to use amongst the body of Christ, to build each other and to encourage uh, one another. And so it's Jesus, really the master who's going away, this master who went away on a long journey. Now you put Jesus in this place, who is the master. He has went away. He's gone away on this long journey. He was there in Matthew 28 when he told his disciples. He said, I'm leaving. You go and teach and preach and baptize those in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to be with you always, even unto the ends of the earth. What he was saying is, one day I'm coming back. So be about your father's business. Just as Jesus said when he was 12 years old in the temple and he astounded those uh, priests and prophets that were listening to him and those, uh, you know, of that uh, upper echelon listening to him teach at 12 years old. He said, I've got to be about my father's business and I want to be about my father's business. If God's given me abilities and God's given me these things and these gifts, I want to take these because I know I'm going to be responsible for them and I want to take what he's given me and to help others. So the, the, it goes like this. The master gave the one servant, he gave him uh, bags of gold, five bags of silver. Your, your, and your, what's it called? <laughs> Translation. Uh, it, it may use the word talent. A talent was a uh, hundred pieces of silver. And so in that bag, there was a hundred pieces of silver and he had five bags. So he had given that to the first servant. The servant went out and he invested it and he came back with five more. And in verse 21, the master, when he came back, he said, man, he was full of praise. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you more and more responsibilities. Then the one day he given two bags of silver came back and he invested. He had two more. He had doubled his investment brought it to the master and the master said the same thing in verse 23 he said well done he was full of praise thou good and faithful servant you've been faithful in these smaller amount and i'm going to give you many many more responsibilities then the one who was given just one bag of silver he took the silver and he went and buried it he went and buried it and so the question is man i don't want to bury the gifts that god's given me I don't, in layman's terms, I, I don't want to sit on them. You know, I want to, I want to be, I want to be doing something. I want to be about my father's business. And Jesus was very harsh on the one who didn't take the gifts that he had received and the responsibilities was not going to be anymore. Matter of fact, he was take, he took away the silver from him and gave it to the one uh, with five bags, who had now had 10 bags of silver. And the responsibilities, the more I'm giving you more responsibility, but to this one, I'm cutting off. He's cutting me off by not using the gifts that I've given him. Man, Jesus was so, uh, this is all, uh, it's twofold. I mean, the investments, nothing wrong with making the investments, but it also has a spiritual application. And the gifts that God has given us and the love that he's given us through the gospel of Christ to give. Because listen, everybody wants a return on their investment. Everybody does. Um, the farmer when he plants, and I love going to Indiana to see my parents and, and uh, the corn right now, man, it is so tall. When we were just, you know, a month ago, it was knee high, waist high, but now it just, it towers and it's just rows and fields of corn. It's, it's, you can taste it, you know, so I just, 
I pulled over to the side and I said, Joy, just a second. I got out and I started snapping about 20 pieces of corn off, you know, and put it in the bag and I brought it back. I'm just kidding. I didn't do that, y'all. If you, <laughs> I wanted to. If some of you have done it, you need to take that corn back, all right? And you take it back and just throw it back in the field <laughs> and ask God to forgive you. Uh, I'm just kidding. But, you know, when a farmer, you know, he, he cultivates and he, he tills up the ground, he plants a seed, he expects to reap a harvest. What that farmer sows, he wants to reap. My wife put a garden out this year. She's always talked about, I want a garden, I want a garden. And, and I, you know, I, I wasn't very helpful, uh, you know, because I know a garden takes a lot of work. You got to get out there and you got to weed the garden and you got to work it. And I just said, man, I don't know. But she said, I'm going to have a garden. She was determined to have a garden. So, man, we've got cucumbers and, 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 and tomatoes and parsley, parsley, pers, par, par, what is it? basil basil uh basil and and paisley and whatever it's it's good <laughs> i think you can smoke it i'm not real sure but it's really good and we got tomatoes and we got beans and it is i water she weeds you know and i don't i don't stand here like this and do this number it's one of those things joe that goes like this back and forth back and forth and i just sit in a chair and we talk you know uh, now, our good friends in our small group, Jeff and Holly Norton, my wife said, man, I'd like to have a garden. He said, we'll come over and help you. Uh, and Jeff, they have a big garden at their house. I said, oh, that'd be great. And I'm thinking, now, remember, there's a lot of work afterwards, you know. And uh, he brought his tiller, and it's about this size right here. And she brought the fencing, Holly did. And they fenced it out uh, because we got deer and coyote. And, um, you know, and, man, I just can't believe it. How he went over and he put the compost on it and man he went over it no i wouldn't have done that you know i tried to get up and help you know and i kind of favor my hip and they said just sit down just sit down we know thank you thank you you know <laughs> I, this really has gotten me out of a lot of work this year <laughs> i promise and so my wife's out there uh, you know and i'm saying come on honey let me help you get, get out of here you ain't doing nothing but man it's this tall all the tomatoes Everybody returns. Everybody expects a return, you know, on, on their investment. And when, listen, when you invest into the kingdom of God, you're going to get back. You with expectation, when you sow into God's kingdom, man, God's going to give it back. It's what he promised. You know, you can't, here's those Macedonian Christians, you know, in 2 Corinthians, Paul uh, he was talking about the, and here's what was happening. They were giving uh, with, uh, the word there is with zeal. They were enthusiastic about giving. They wanted to help those who were in need. They'd see the need uh, with, in, in people's lives, and so they would, they would give. They gave zealously. And then they gave liberally. Uh, they, they had to give. They gave. Uh, they wanted to give. They looked for ways to give. And then... They gave more, and then they gave with purpose. There was a purpose in their giving. They'd see somebody, you know, who a, a believer, another believer who was down on their luck, and they got all their resources together, and they would help. And it, this was during the time of first century Christianity when there was a lot of persecution, and people were being persecuted for their faith. They were being thrown into prison. They were being killed for their faith. But out of that, they really grew, and so... Paul talks about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and I want to end up with this passage right here, 2 Corinthians 8, beginning in verse 1. Now, I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles, and there's the, 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 the tribulation and the trials they were going through and the persecution. They were very poor. On top of that, they didn't have anything to give. But they were also filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And, and they did it of their, their own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. They even did more than we had hoped. For their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us just as God wanted them to. So we have urged Titus, who encouraged your giving in the first place, to return you to you and encourage you to finish this ministry of giving. 
Since you excel in so many ways in your faith, your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, your love from us, I, I want you to excel also in a gracious act of giving. I'm not commanding you to do this, but I'm testing how genuine your love is by comparing it with the eagerness of other churches. You know the generous grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor so that by his poverty, he could make you rich. Here is my advice. It would be good for you to finish what you started a year ago. Last year, you were the first who wanted to give, and you were the first to begin doing it. Now you should finish what you've started by encouraging and giving to other believers. Let the eagerness you showed in the beginning be matched now by your giving. Give in proportion to what you have. Whatever you give is acceptable if you give it eagerly and give according to what you have and not what you don't have. And so here's just a, a couple of things. A couple of things, they were poor. And they, so they were giving out of their poverty to help others. Not only that, they were giving beyond the power that they, and here's the result of it. I read it in verse two. Uh, you should go back and read that. They were filled with joy. They didn't have anything to give, but they would see somebody with a need and they would get all the resources together and they'd say, let's help, let's help. And they were, they were being specific. This is important. Even if you don't have it to give, you know, when you pray specifically. We showed this video on Wednesday night uh, during prayer time. We meet here for prayer at 615. Whatever your need is in your life, you know, just... Uh, you bring that need here and, you know, we pray specifically for your need. Um, so this video, and I, I'm sure you've seen some of the uh, uh, movies uh, that it talks about a little bit in here. Um, the Facing the Giants, Courageous, Fireproof, Flywheel, some of these uh, Christian movies that are being made today. And these three brothers out of... Uh, South Carolina who have produced a lot of these Christian movies and with the help of people in their churches that they attend. But when we finished with the video, we finished with communion on Wednesday night. Tom Mercer, one of our uh, attendees, he just happened to say, you know, in closing, and he closed us out in a prayer, and he said, you know, be specific. The whole video was telling, you know, be specific when you ask God. And God wants to meet our needs. We were very plain, you know, in the last two weeks in giving that verse of Matthew 6 and verse 33, when Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God, you know, and his righteousness and all these things, your basic necessities, those things that you need, don't worry about them because I'm going to take, that's a promise from God. I'm going to take care of you. But the important thing is, and the promise that comes from that, the premise, I'll use that again, is seek first the kingdom of God. You know, follow him. Uh, you know, follow him with your heart. And, and just, uh, you know, look for ways and God will bless. So I wanted, I thought, uh, Les Pilot and I were talking yesterday. He said, man, that was such an impactful video. And so I thought, we'll show it again. So thanks, Les, for uh, bringing this to our tent. I wanted everybody to see this. And just a wonderful, uh, specific uh, being specific when you pray and asking God to give. On April 13th, 2013, Ronwin Kendrick wrote a very specific prayer on a sticky note. She wrote it down but didn't tell anybody. She planted that sticky note in her Bible, in faith that if it were God's will, he would bring the request about. A lot of Mrs. Kendrick's life is spent planting seeds, in faith that something beautiful will grow. I love being outdoors. I guess it's part of growing up on the farm and planting something and then just watching it grow. You can take the girl out of the farm, but you can't take the farm out of the girl. And so she goes out and works outside all the time. For the spring garden, we planted uh, green beans. It's therapy for her. Sweet potatoes. It's a joy for her. Squash. To get her hands dirty and see something bloom. Zucchini. She has transformed her backyard from a an ugly backyard into something very beautiful over the years. Last year I tried corn and that didn't work. 
Mrs. Kendrick not only cultivates her garden every day, she also cultivates a close relationship with the Lord. In the mornings, I like to take my Bible and I go to my kitchen table and I put my Bible on the table and I, I stand. If I stand, I don't doze off and, and I just start praying. And Mrs. Kendrick uses a lot of scripture when she prays. In the mornings, I like to read Psalm 23. The Lord is our shepherd, we shall not want. And then Psalm 25. Show us your ways, O Lord, teach us your paths. Deuteronomy 28. We're blessed in the city, blessed in the field. Blessed is the fruit of our body. The verse is in Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continue to be in my mouth. They that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Psalm 37. Delight thyself in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. This is the day the Lord hath made. Psalm 118. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Isaiah 54. All your children shall be taught of the Lord. I've been quoting this for years. Galatians 3. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Psalm 19. We will say of the Lord, He is our refuge. He covers us with His feathers, and under His wings do we trust. At a young age, Mrs. Kendrick discovered the power of prayer in a very dramatic way. I was six years old. This was on April the 1st, 1948. A tornado came and it hit their property where there was a farm. And I remember Mother taking my sister Carol and my sister Bonnie and me and she put us under the kitchen table and she says she remembers looking up and watching her mother cry out to god i, I remember her just crying out to the but she was just crying at the top of her voice asking the lord to protect us A few minutes later, the sound died down. They walked outside, and all around them, there was devastation. The uh, roof to, to our barn, which was the next to the house, was blown off. And they never found that roof. Two huge oak trees in front of our house across the highway had fallen down. Power lines were down in the front yard. The church across the street was rocked off of its foundation, but their house was left intact and preserved. Our house was not touched. I think I learned from that, that, that we need to be able to call on God anytime, any circumstance, that God is near, that he loves us. And I saw a very quick answer to prayer. When Ronwin married Larry Kendrick and began a family, they made prayer a big part of their daily lives. Before our children were born, my husband and I prayed over them, that the Lord would have his will, his way with them. Mom and dad made prayer a part of everything that they did. You know, we're not only praying before meals, but we're praying before major decisions. One thing that we would see in our parents is they wouldn't hold back in their prayer lives. You know, it, it, they wouldn't pray just small prayers, but they believed that God could provide, he could protect, he could do things. So there was a, a sense of the Lord is able to carry us through this and provide what we need. Today, all three of the Kendrick brothers, Shannon, Alex, and Stephen, are involved in filmmaking. And on the set of each film, prayer has been a crucial part of their process. All five of the films that we have produced have really been a string of one answer prayer after another. Uh, we're praying as we're writing. We haven't had the script writing training, so we're laying it before the Lord saying, would you enable us to develop these characters? As we're casting, we're praying over the casting process. Every day on set, we'll have a prayer team a part of that. We're dedicating the day to the Lord. And then we have prayer warriors that we will email each week and say, here's how you can pray for us. Here's what's coming up. So we have seen, again, consistently that when we bathe things in prayer, when we fight our battles in prayer first, the Lord is faithful to answer those. Their most recent film went to number one at the box office. It was specifically about prayer. We didn't know what was going to happen with it, but War Room was more successful. The impact has been even more far-reaching than the other films. And so we can see now that the timing was perfect for a call to prayer to the church. I think the character of Miss Clara was the combination of many godly elderly women that we've known over the years, and our mother is definitely one of those who helped inspire that character. Oftentimes we'll call and we'll say, Mom, here's what's going on, Here, here's how we need your prayer support. As we're traveling, as we're working on production, she's praying for us. And we consistently see 
the rewards of that. We know, you can sense sometimes, there's somebody who's been praying for me. <laughs> and so I am so grateful for a praying mom. Over the years, as her sons gained a national platform to speak about the Lord, Mrs. Kendrick preferred to be at home. She's been spending her time caring for her husband, who's been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, praying for hours in her kitchen, and of course, taking care of her garden. One thing that we saw happen, though, is she would be out there working hard by herself, and she'd be carrying buckets, and uh, she's in her 70s, you know, and, and carrying fertilizer and those kind of things, and we would say, Mom, you need to be really careful. If something happened to you since you take care of Dad, you know, it could it could be tough on everybody. You know, we, we want you to be safe and to be uh, healthy and, and to be in a good place. I woke up on a Saturday morning, the day of her birthday, and I sat up in bed, and I had this strong feeling that I needed to go buy Mom a golf cart. And so I called my brothers and my dad, and I said, uh, golf cart's thousands of dollars. What if we all pulled our money together and got her a golf cart? And they all said, yes, let's do it. So we all went over to mom's house. All 19 grandchildren were over there. Um, mom and dad are there. We said, mom, we have a birthday gift to give for you. So we took her outside. We said, we need you to close your eyes. And we pulled this golf cart around. And in just a couple of minutes, he said, you can open your eyes. And she opened her eyes and then mom started to cry. And he had driven up in a red golf cart. And I looked at it and it was hard to believe she said, I just can't believe it. I can't believe it. Now, do you remember the prayer that Mrs. Kendrick wrote on that sticky note? She wrote that down about a week before her birthday. And when she received the golf cart, she went and got that note out of her Bible and read it to the family. And it said, Dear Heavenly Father, Based on John 16, 23, I asked for a golf cart for my birthday. I asked for a golf cart in excellent condition, a beautiful golf cart that I will love. So I'm asking you, Lord, if you would give me for my birthday a golf cart. She had prayed that and written it down and not told anybody, and just between her and the Lord. And so we were so excited because we brought all the kids around and we said, listen to this. Mama Kay was praying for a golf cart for her birthday, didn't tell anybody. And this morning, the Lord prompted us to go buy her a golf cart. You've been hearing a story of one specific answer to prayer, but what's striking when you get to know Mrs. Kendrick is that this kind of thing happens all the time. She has a lot of stories of answered prayer, just like this golf cart. The golf cart story just illustrates a bigger principle, that God hears our prayers. And Mrs. Kendrick and Stephen both realize that we need people who will be crying out in prayer like never before. I believe that God wants women to pray over their homes, pray over their husbands, to pray over their children every day that God will have his way, will have his will with us. When we look at our country, we look at how dark our world is right now, how the church with broken wings is sick in so many ways. And it is for such a time as this that I believe the Holy Spirit is calling people and calling women back to prayer for their husbands, for their children, just like our mom has done for our father and for us over the years. My prayer is that God will grant repentance to the church across the nation, and that as believers are praying, that the Holy Spirit will move in in power and change hearts and shift the course of our country. This is probably the most important election that we've ever had, and I think we need to cry out to the Lord. Believers, right now need to be humbling themselves and seeking the Lord, crying out to Him uh, in prayer. And I believe that we're gonna see a great harvest in our generation. Let's stand together.